This is Sandra Osterberis with CFOIC Heartland. Welcome to Kdumim. Dumim is a very special place for me. Even though I have never lived here, I was actually here when this community began. We have to go back to December of 1975. It is Hanukkah. It is raining and pouring, freezing outside. I am 18 years old and I'm here for a year studying Bible in Jerusalem. The word goes out, they are starting a new community in Samaria. Now I have to say, a first community in Samaria, because at that point there wasn't a single community anywhere in Samaria. The word went out that at two in the morning we're supposed to go and get on some bus on some street corner in Jerusalem, and we were going to go in the dead of night. We were going in the dead of night because this was against the government desires. Uh, at the time there was a labor government in power, and they were against the whole idea of settlement in Judea and Samaria. Anyway, I was ready to go. I went to sleep with my shoes on, a uh, sleeping bag for a pillow. I had my winter coat ready to go, and someone was supposed to wake me up to make that 2 a.m. bus, and they never woke me up. I am not good at getting up early, so there I woke up the next morning, 7 a.m., to discover I had been left behind. So I actually missed that historic moment when all these young people that ended up being tens of thousands of people out here, uh, right near here actually, it wasn't on this spot. Uh, they gathered in a place uh, north uh, east of here called Sebastia. Uh, it was an abandoned railroad station uh, and the group themselves called themselves Elon Moreh, the Oak of Moreh group. The word Kedumim had not yet been invented, okay? So this was a group, they called themselves the Oak of Moreh group and they wanted to establish a community somewhere near the Oak of Moreh, where God first promised the land to Abraham. Well, at the end of the day, the government compromised and said, okay, you can come here to this place where there was a military camp near an Arab village called Kadum. And in fact, the military camp was also called Kadum. And they allowed 30 families to settle here in tents and barracks in the army camp. Two weeks later, I was able to come out here. I came out with two friends. Um, we hitched hike out here. There, of course, no public transportation here yet. We hitch hike with this guy driving a car. This was this tiny car. There was no room for anything. I remember being crawled in next to some boxes. It was an insane experience. I came out here, and this is where we were. Now, today you see a community, you see cars, you see houses, people. There are 4,000 people living in this community today. Then there was nothing. There was an army camp and a few young families living in the army camp, okay? So that was my personal experience, and they lived like that in temporary conditions. The conditions improved a few weeks after I was there, and they actually brought the first mobile homes to this hill, and they established themselves, and they became a community. In May of 1977, Menachem Begin became the first Prime Minister of Israel for the Likud Party, and it is under his direction that the whole settlement policy changed. But the actual change in that policy was witnessed right here where I'm standing. And this is what happened. The elections were a very close call, and people were up all night watching the electoral returns, and finally at some point towards the morning, it became clear that there was a complete change in the government, Menachem Begin was going to be the first Likud Prime Minister of Israel. Now, during that time, there were already a number of families living here in mobile homes, and a group of them got together, and they had already planned that in a few weeks' time, they were going to, they, would, they had just built a temporary uh, synagogue. It actually was like two mobile homes put together, and they were going to have it as a synagogue, and they wanted to have a special dedication ceremony where they were going to bring in a Torah scroll into this so-called temporary synagogue. They had this idea. These are young people in their late 20s, and they're saying, hey, Menachem Begin, we know him. He's like our kind of guy. He loves settlement. He's always been talking about biblical Israel. How about if we go and we invite him to join us for the dedication of that synagogue. Oh, great idea. So they got on a bus and they go to Tel Aviv. 
the morning after the elections, okay, and they knock on Menachem Begin's door. Now, at that point, he's living in an apartment, a very modest apartment in Tel Aviv. These were very different times than today. They knock on the door. Menachem Begin himself answers the door in his bathrobe. It was already almost noon, but he had been up all night watching the election returns and goes to have sleep. And then he gets up and he's in his robe and he says, oh my goodness, I know you guys, you're the Kadumim people. And he welcomes them into his house. And they come and they say, we want to invite you to come and participate in this dedication of the first synagogue in the first community in Samaria in thousands of years. Well, he was thrilled. He came to that dedication. He stood right here on the cement platform and he made this declaration. He said, there will be many more settlements in Samaria. And with the beginning of his um, tenure as prime minister, we saw absolute uh, explosion of Jewish communities settled all over Judea Samaria. And it is right here where I'm standing that that history was made. Hi, I'm Danny Ehrlich here in Karnei Shomron with Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. We're here in the mountains of Israel, which is such an amazing place to be. You know, I grew up in the United States, like Sandra Barris grew up in the United States, uh, and we used to learn Tanakh, we used to learn the Bible. I love learning Bible, I loved it as a kid, I love it as an adult. But you know, when you sit in the United States in the classroom, or in Australia, or anywhere else in the world, and you learn the Bible, it's very, teachers have to work very hard to make it come alive. Because you're looking at a text, you're sitting in a classroom. You come to Israel, you come and see the biblical heartland with Christian friends of Israeli communities, and it jumps out at you. I mean, here's a perfect example. If you look down in the valley, I don't know if we can see down in the valley, there's a riverbed, a nachal in Hebrew, a riverbed. And this nachal is known as nachal Kana, Nachal Kana. That's today. And you know what? 2,000 years ago and 3,000 years ago and probably 4,000 years ago it was also known as Nachal Kana. And if we go back more than 3,000 years ago when the tribes of Israel are conquering the land of Canaan and Joshua will divide uh, the, the land between the different tribes, this is a tribal marker. Now, if you're in the book of Joshua uh, in, uh, and you learn the verse, uh, Joshua uh, 16 and Joshua 17, where it gives the borders of Ephraim and Menashe, Ephraim and Manasseh, it's kind of dry. It's like, you know, it's like doing a math thing, you know, draw a line here, draw a line there, doesn't mean anything. But folks, take a look here. We're, we see here Karnei Shomron of today, we'll get back to that. But look at the valley, where we're standing right now, where I am standing right now, I am in the territory of the tribe of Manasseh of over 3,000 years ago. And if you look at the hills on the other side of the valley, we're looking at the the, the biblical portion of the tribe of Ephraim. So we see Ephraim on one side of the, of the valley and we see Menashe on the other side. Now when you stand here you understand why this is a border. When you read it in the text it could be anything, it could be a, a tree, it could be a hole in the ground, but you see this is a natural barrier. So you have one tribe on one side of the hills and the other tribe, Ephra Manasseh here to the north and Ephraim to the south. Now both Ephraim and Manasseh are the sons of Joseph. So we're in Joseph territory. And that brings us to another biblical account that happens right here in this area with Ephraim to the south and Manasseh here to the north. And this is also recorded in the book of Joshua. Uh, and here we go uh, to Joshua 17, one chapter after the borders have been set. The elders, the leaders of the tribes of Joseph, of Ephraim and Manasseh, come to Joshua. The land has been conquered. God has given us victory. And we're starting to put Jewish communities here, Ephraim communities and Manasseh communities here on the hilltops, and we're farming the valleys. And the elders of the tribes come to Joshua and say, Joshua, you know that we, the sons of Joseph, are a very large people. We have a lot of families and flocks and farms. There's not enough land that we can farm in the valley to feed ourselves. So what does Joshua tell them? Joshua says what you need to do, see the, see the slopes of the mountains? We can see them here today. The slopes of the mountains have forests on them, Joshua says. What you need to do is go in, onto the mountains and clear 
the trees so that you can farm them. Now, you know, how do you farm a hill? Well, I mean, we can understand how you farm a valley, right? It's flat, you go, you plow it, you plant. How the heck can you farm a hill? Well, this is not new. For thousands of years, human beings have figured out how to do it. What you have to do is you have to create terraces. You like make steps, steps in the valley. And, he, and we can actually see some of them. You see some of the stones. Sometimes it's natural, sometimes it's built. You create levels levels going down so you can farm each level. And all over the land of Israel, especially here in the biblical heartland, we can see these terraces. Now, people wonder sometimes, when were these terraces built? When were the mountains turned into arable land, land that agriculture could be done on? And the Bible, as so often it does, gives us the answer. It tells us when the tri tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh came here, the the hills were not yet uh, cleared for farming. They were not yet terraced. Uh, so it's the, when F, it's the elders of Ephraim and Manasseh 3,000 plus years ago speaking to Joshua. Joshua gives them the idea what you need to do is clear the forests uh, and, and, and you can use it as agricultural land, which means that they terraced it. So as we, if you drive through this area, and we'll see all over the hills of Israel here uh, that there are terraces we know that these terraces go back to the days of the children of Israel, the tribes of Israel coming into this land and finding the beautiful forests, but needing land that they can grow food for their family. It also helps us understand, remember, a land of milk and honey. This is a blessed land that God has blessed. Uh, and sometimes people came here, like Mark Twain in the 1800s, more than 100 years ago, and said, land of milk and honey? The land had become so barren and so desolate and that people had a hard time believing that was once a land of milk and honey. But again, the Bible tells us clearly, forests, forests had to be cut down. And today, again, we see, we see the natural growth here when the land is taken care of, as it is now as part of the state of Israel. When the land is tilled uh, and tended, we get back the forests that used to be here. So we're standing here uh, in, the year, in the year 2020, but we're also standing here more than 3,000 years ago with the elders of Manasseh and the elders of Ephraim and Joshua. Can you imagine them down here in the valley? And they're complaining, we don't have enough space. And Joshua says, what do you mean you don't have enough space? Look at these hills. All you need to do is clear them uh, and then you will have, and that's exactly what happened. And today, we come back 3,000 years later and here we are again, Karne Shomron here in the tribal allotment of Manasseh. Uh, and across the way, we're looking at Nophim. Uh, and, and what else do we see there? Gakir and Nophim, uh, Jewish communities in the tribal allotment of Ephraim. So uh, uh, history is, it goes around as God promised. I will take you out from the land and I will bring you back to the land. And we'll get into some of the biblical prophecies as we continue. As Danny explained, right behind me is the tribe of Ephraim. And what you see on those hilltops are two modern Jewish communities, Yakir, and then to the left, Nofim. Uh, these are communities that uh, are, were developed here in the early 80s and have just, they're just beautiful communities, Jewish families raising their children. And these are communities that Christian Friends of Israeli Communities has been involved with for a very long time. Some of you may have even visited the community of Yakir, where we've been very involved in helping new immigrants coming from France, imagine. Okay, we talked about how Joshua came here 3,000 years ago for the first time bringing the children of Israel into the land. And today, in 2020, we have Jewish immigrants from France coming and living right there in the community of Yakir. Now, we are actually standing in Carne Shomron, and I'd like to give you a little bit of a glimpse of that. We're jumping across from Ephraim back to Manasseh, and you can see behind me the community of Carne Shomron. This is my own community. And of course, I have a very strong feeling for my own community. This community is actually the, one of the elder brothers of the communities in Samaria because it was founded in 1977, and it's a great story. 
just a year and a half before, there was already a community that was developed just about, I don't know, 10 miles down the road from here called Kadumim. That community was established at the end of 1975. Fast forward 1977, that community is still living in, you know, makeshift structures and they have just gotten official approval because Menachem Begin became prime minister. And there's this couple that are going for a drive on the holiday of Sukkot during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they're saying, gee, wouldn't it be great? We're going to go visit Kudumim. We want to see what they're doing over there. And they're saying, wouldn't it be great if we could start another community somewhere nearby in Samaria? follow in the, in the heels of those wonderful pioneers from two years earlier. And they came here and they found this area. Now, right near here, we have these two mountains that rise up out of the landscape. And these mountains were always referred to as the horns of Samaria, hence the name Carne Shomron. Carne Shomron means horns of Samaria. So they come there and they say, hey, just at the foot of these hills, what a great place to start a community. And they look around and they test it out and they get some friends involved and they go home. And they say, this is where we want to start a community. Well, they managed to get Ariel Sharon, who was then Minister of Defense, they managed to get him interested in this community. He says, wow, this is a great idea. It has both strategic importance and, and, and geographical validity. It is very close to Tel Aviv. In fact, I don't know if you can see it that closely, but I can see it as just over the hills. I see already some of the tall buildings of Hora Sharon and Ranana. Just beyond that is Tel Aviv. So anybody standing on these hilltops will really be in control of the area just to the west of us, which is what we call pre-67 Israel. So it has very good strategic importance as well. Anyway, he's about to give the approval. They bring a few tents. Imagine a community. This is in 1977. We're not talking about in 1877. In 1977, this is a community that starts with some tents, okay? And they come here, and then the President of the United States wakes up and says, oh my goodness, those settlers, they went and started another community. This is no good. Settlements, we're against settlements. Ariel Sharon, at that point, was probably the settlement movement's biggest defender and actual proponent. And so what did he say? He said, now wait a second. Menachem Begin, who was the prime minister, he made an, he made an, understand, he made an agreement with the president of the United States that we're not going to have settlements just because we like the view. We are going to only create settlements in places that we think have strategic importance, that, that, have, that fill some kind of security need. How are we going to do that? Ah, we'll put up an army base. So he, as Minister of Defense, went and put up an army base on this hill, and then he says, oh, this is really not a regular settlement. It's a security settlement because it's here to support the army base. And that's how Carnation Rome began. Of course, we've grown tremendously uh, since that early time in 1977. I first came here in 1982. And at that point, the only houses on the, on, in this area were the ones we see in this neighborhood over here, right in front of me. Um, you know, maybe we can take a look. Uh, these are a few of the houses over here and just beyond are more houses. And I remember driving around here and seeing some of these houses that were just them being built. They had the just, they just had the frame. They weren't even, no one was even living in them yet. The first families that moved into Carnation into permanent houses. They'd been in caravans and mobile homes and things until then. But the first families moved into their permanent homes only in 1982. I've been living here since 1987. I moved to Israel in 1985 and immediately signed up to build a house here in Carnation And here we've been ever since today, from that modest beginning in 1977 of that one family with a dream. Today, we have close to 10,000 people living here, and we're spread across five different hills. Come and visit us. This is Sandra Osterberis from Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. I hope you enjoyed that video and we'd like to be sure you're getting all of our video content. So just click on the subscribe button below as well as on the notification bell and that way you will have easy access to all our material. We look forward to staying in touch with you. God bless you and have a wonderful day.